You're good. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, my name is Katrina Hafner, and I am the conference director for the Students for Liberty Portland Regional Conference. And here, who I have with me is Blake Feldman, who is going to be one of the speakers. Blake, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure. I'm Blake Feldman. I recently graduated from law school at the University of Georgia, and now I am the advocacy coordinator for criminal justice reform um, for the ACLU of Mississippi. So what made you want to reach out to me to speak at this conference? Um, well, right now, it's a very common topic, criminal justice reform, but once you get into it, you start to notice really common themes in how it's covered in um, general media or um, kind of generalized political rhetoric. So you often, if you read an article on criminal justice reform today, it will probably start out um, mentioning that it's bipartisan, talking about an unlikely alliance between the Koch brothers and the ACLU. Um, then you'll hear that the U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of it's incarcerated. And then you'll usually hear something about sentencing reform or ending the war on drugs. But even if we were to decriminalize drugs and have more reasonable sentencing, that wouldn't come close to solving a lot of our problems with the criminal justice system. So I just think that it's important to analyze potential reforms now really critically to make sure that we're not just um, implementing stopgap measures that have failed in the past. What do you plan to speak about specifically at the conference? Um, so pretty much everything from police civilian encounters to um, sentencing a lot of it's left out. So um, I think that a lot of topics have fallen by the way of SAD. Um, we need to reevaluate the need for um, pretrial detention, so bail reform, um, things like that, municipal court schemes that are really unfair, um, and money-making meals debtor's prison is a problem and something that I care more about um, within the entire system is the need for indigent defense reform because all across the country people are denied access to a uh, public defender. Um, but then on the back end and what's really interesting to me is all the hurdles that face people with criminal records in our country. Um, which is of more concern now just because of the internet and because of keeping records. Um, the government does it more than they ever have before. Um, and that can, that can cause problems with immigration, with housing, with employment, um, with so many different things. So a lot of these collateral consequences of arrest can um, really turn someone's life upside down. So um, it's really, what's so interesting to me about collateral consequences is um, just how it's so um, opposite to all of these, what most people think about when they think about the criminal justice system the innocent until proven guilty, and even what they think about when they think of America and what it stands for. Liberty, justice, due process, and the current system in place really can damage someone for just an arrest more than most people would imagine 
your life can be damaged with a conviction. Um, so on the one hand, I don't want to ramble about all the different ways that have gone unnoticed because I could maybe make criminal justice reform seem even more abstract than it already does. But um, a, an, a theory or theme that I'm really working on right now um, is just the need for our generation to constantly question reforms that superficially um, everyone wants to applaud and everybody wants to say, oh, that's great, this is progress, but um, we really do have to be hypercritical to make sure that the, that it's going to be product-based, that it's going to be evidence-based and actually promote justice rather than just reframe the problem. Can you give us some examples of how there are superficial interventions or solutions that are being proposed? Uh, certainly. So last summer I uh, was an intern with the Bronx Defenders, which is a public defenders firm in um, New York City, and they're a role model for me in this regard of questioning reforms that on their face look great is the executive director there, Robin Steinberg. So um, two examples that come to mind. First is um, when New York City said that they were going to stop arresting people for simple marijuana possession in small amounts. And that instead they would just issue court summons, so like a ticket. And everyone thought that that was great, this was progress, it's not legalization, but it's decriminalizing it to a certain degree. And then she had an amazing op-ed two days later about how that wasn't good enough, how the systems are already backlogged with summonses, and that the incentives to play bargain at that stage are just as bad as they are for misdemeanors. Um, a few a few months later, New York City had some great um, bail reform, like I was talking about um, pre-trial detention, where they were going to kind of move away from that and um, have pre-trial release. And that's great from superficially as someone who is seriously considering a career in public defense, you know that if your client isn't held in jail until trial, they're less likely to take a plea if they're innocent and more willing to fight it. Um, so even I applauded that reform. And then a few days later, she had an amazing op-ed that called out the um, called out that system for pretty much imposing conditions on this pretrial release that are very similar to, if not more severe than typical conditions of probation. So I, these are for people who are innocent, haven't gone to trial at all, but they would have the monitoring, the supervision, the substance abuse tests, supervision fees even, um, that someone would have on probation. And then violating that could be sure that even more um, trouble with the criminal court. So there's there's just lots of there's lots of reforms that look like a little win, but you really have to kind of question it from I think it's core is are we still regulating people without reason, um, regulating their lives, and imposing more hurdles on them to um, escape whatever marginalization the criminal justice system has already imposed on them? And it's um, 
it's just gotten to the point where even these small reforms, you just wonder what is the... Um, we really have to question what is the purpose of our criminal justice system and is a policy such as monitoring someone, testing them for substance abuse, making them pay fees before they even go to trial, is that compatible with our view of the criminal justice system, especially when a lot of times we know that it doesn't reduce crime rates, and even with the juvenile system, there's countless studies to support the notion that it actually fosters criminality. What got you into this this area, criminal justice reform? So, I, um, I got my bachelor's degree in biology, and I was pre-med, but I um, decided I didn't want to go to med school, and I didn't want to be a scientist. Um, so I actually went to law school with an interest in international law and possibly public health law. Um, but it was my first semester, you have to take crim law. It was the most interesting course to me. Um, really, because I thought that it was interesting that a lot of my classmates weren't as concerned as I was um, of how in the legal system procedure and finality really can trump fairness and innocence in the criminal justice system. Um, and then my second semester, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative um, gave a Sibley lecture. And he's recently released a book, Just Mercy, that's a bestseller. Um, but, and he had a viral TED Talk too. But I hadn't seen the TED Talk and the guest lecture was really kind of an outline for his book that was not yet released and with a little bit of a TED Talk in it and that was that was my point of no return when I knew that I wanted to get into this work. Um, although being in law school, of course, you think that all that you want to do is litigate. Um, and I did, I've had a lot of experience with different public defenders offices, but um, I think that right now, while the public debate is going on with criminal justice reform, that I want to be part of that um, policy development for the next few years, and um, then maybe into public defense, maybe do both at the same time, I don't know, but um, at least for the next five years, I think that it we really are in a pivotal moment because we can't maintain mass incarceration in this country. It costs too much money. Um, it doesn't make sense. There's reason. There's good reason that it's bipartisan. No one wants to continue supporting the system that we have. But um, it. There's no reason to believe that we can just sit back and say okay, this is going to fix itself and we're going to come up with a more rational um, system. We, we kind of never have. So like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow talks about um, how we just have a steadily evolving, evolving system of marginalizing people of country of color in our country, um, and that's not a new argument. Um, we had um, uh, I can't think of the book from the early 1900s, but I mean it's really not a new revolutionary idea, even though it really was to tie it to mass incarceration. But time and time again 
we get to a point where we try to make our system more fair, but um, in a couple of decades we realize that there's lots of problems with it then. And I think that there's, um, it's really easy to just allow the system to become not as bad as opposed to seizing this opportunity to really make sure that our criminal justice, our incarceration rate isn't dropping by 1%, um, like it did this past year. The Bureau of Justice Statistics just released its report, and like once again, our prison population fell from like 1.7 million to 1.6 something, and it's great, sentencing reform is good, but then we have to make sure that prosecutors aren't overcharging, which they have a tendency to do once we start dropping sentencing reform. We have to make sure that um, elected judges aren't acting counter to our legislative initiatives to fix the system. There's just too many um, pieces in play for us to fix sentencing and decriminalize drugs and then think that we've kind of fixed it. So in the past few years, I've been getting more into learning about the criminal justice um, system, especially prison reform. And I've been looking through organizations that, that, that centered on it. However, I found that most of it revolved around race and the drug war. And while they're both important issues, I, I wanted to find something that covered it in a broader context. And so when planning for this upcoming conference in Portland, I was talking with, camp, with fellow campus coordinators, and we were talking about how great it would be to find a speaker who could call, cover these broader, um, these broader topics around uh, criminal justice reform. So we're really glad we found you. And so I want to ask you, are there any um, books, uh, TV shows, or movies, fiction or nonfiction, that you think do a good job of portraying what goes on in the American criminal justice system? Um, as far as TV shows and movies, I'm kind of hypercritical of how it's portrayed in a lot of them. I mean, like, I'm a fan of Orange is the New Black, but um, I don't... I honestly don't know if any television show or movie could even um, kind of capture the devastation of the system and kind of maintain a broad enough base. Um, so if you're ever watching a TV show or a movie and there's a subplot with someone incarcerated or someone formerly incarcerated, um, it's not going to paint the full picture, but I still think that it's beneficial. Um, books? I'm really into indigenous defense reform. I think that, um, I mean, John Adams is my favorite um, from the colonial days because he represented the uh, um, British soldiers who shot the first rounds at the Boss Massacre. I mean, he said everyone has a right to um, be represented. And um, it really is crucial. Our justice system is really 
arrogant and lawyers are arrogant and it's designed to where you're not going to be able to um, maneuver the system without access to counsel. So no matter what rights you have, what good are they if you don't have a lawyer who's going to be able to raise them on your behalf? So um, books, I would say indefensible is great. Um, it's courtroom three something. It's about um, pretty much someone observed courtroom proceedings in the metropolitan area and just documented. Um, this is what I saw today. This person goes in front of the judge for five seconds. He met with his public defender for three minutes. Took a deal for ten years, and. Um, they're more artful and more profound in how they um, tell the story of the daily injustice in our criminal courts. But those books are my favorite. It's not so much prison reform, but to the extent that you want to separate prison reform from criminal justice reform. But um, I. I do find more of an appeal to the human aspect going into the criminal system um, than within. I know that's awful. I support prison rights activists, but I think that there's something that um, makes it easier for every American to understand when you're talking about someone just like you who's about to enter the system because our criminal law has failed them by not appointing them a public defender, by making it easy to be coerced into a plea bargain, um, and things like that. I think that it's easier for us to realize that's really messed up um, when someone doesn't have shackles on them yet. Is that all of your recommendations? Um, I mean, my other interest is um, racial injustice, so like my big books for anyone who is into that that's listening um, would be, of course, The New Jim Crow, which even if you're not, I think that it's still a really brilliant example of um, being hypercritical and um, especially of trends of just injustice taking another form rather than us actually tackling it and um, definitely Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy um, which yeah I mean he's kind of different than me in that respect and that he really humanizes someone while they're incarcerated. Um, so, I mean, that book's amazing. Either of those two, for sure. <laughs> well, it, it seems like the viewers will have some books to read over the next few. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen the 1930s film, You Only Live Once? No, I haven't. I just watched that about a week ago. It's from 1937 or something, film noir, black and white. And it was probably the most depressing thing I've seen in a while because it just highlighted a, a man who was, um, who was booked out of jail, uh, booked out of prison for the third time and just how he was unable to go back to a normal life because they, they had trouble. He and his wife had trouble finding somewhere they could live. He had trouble getting jobs and all of that. And it just really hit me because even back then there were, there were so many problems, problems associated with being a criminal and having to go through all, going, have to, having to go through all of that. Yeah. Ordeal of not only um, going through 
um, trial and being put in jail, but living in prison and then having, if you even get out, having to deal with the aftermath of all these charges that are put yeah. against you. I definitely recommend that movie to people, especially if you're a fan of older films. So, yeah, I'll check it out. So, Blake, what are some other political issues that interest you? Um, I mean, I definitely tie in collateral consequences. So, any, um, any system that is affected by an arrest. So, like, I try to anchor my issue that I care most about in criminal justice um, reforms and criminal defense, but that naturally latches on to employment, housing, um, even family law. I mean, people lose their kids when they're arrested. Um, but um, completely removing myself from criminal justice um, uh, probably gender identity. I was kind of late in life um, grasping or coming to terms with um, what white privilege I do have, but I have a very smart and outspoken younger sister who I grew up with, so I was forced to um, come to terms with whatever male privilege I do have earlier on in life. So I'm still very interested in a lot of barriers to gender equality. Okay, and to tie this back to the criminal justice system, do you have um, any thoughts about gender and the topic? I do. I think that it's um, very interesting Especially as especially as lawyers who um, are litigators or criminal defense, like your job is to tell a story. So we sometimes get caught up in narratives, and a very popular narrative is um, the criminal justice system is um, wronging young men of color, and you have and you eventually start to wonder, have we completely left behind women? Um, so the incarceration rate has gone up for men, but in the past few years, it's skyrocketed for women. Um, and are enough people looking into causes for that? Um, also, are we just becoming experts at um, a humanizing a young man in front of a jury or a judge because of we're experts because we've gotten good at it to so where we fail a client who's a woman who's accused of something a crime and then also just the real life consequences of taking fathers from homes like this the criminal justice system has, it doesn't just destroy people, it destroys family. And a lot of the burdens have fallen on women. So um, I'm definitely, I think that black feminists are amazing and have incredible voices. So I'm always interested to hear those takes on um, what the criminal justice system has done to women, particularly women of color. And then also, like with Sandra Bland, it's that was just a case of direct injustice inflicted by um, law enforcement officers in the criminal justice system on a black woman. And I think that that was just a great reminder for us that it's not just young men who are brutalized by the system. Have you ever been to Portland before? No, I haven't. 
<laughs> have you heard all the wonderful things about it? Um, I've seen a few episodes of Portland, yeah. That's about it. <laughs> According to some people I know, people from Portland hate it, but then everybody else around Portland thinks it's really accurate. <laughs> I've never actually seen this show, though. But um, I've heard so, that some... Yeah, there are actually quite a lot of people who are worried that we're coming to Portland because they think the libertarian message won't won't go with the culture. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping with the different speakers we have, like you, that um, uh, residents of Portland will be more open to the idea of this event. Even then, in every city around the U.S., there will be people who antagonize the organization and what we do. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier like how shows like Orange is the New Black and other things don't fully capture the horrors of what happens in those cases. Um, do you think it, um, it, it's at least inspired people to want to make change? Absolutely. Um, I still think that it's great whenever a show, well, I mean, Orange is the New Black for taking it head on, but um, when any show throws in a subplot of a loved one of one of the main characters, if not one of the main characters doing some time or being some way um, negatively affected, by the criminal justice system. I think it's great. Um, I don't expect TVs and movies um, to really address the issue head on and to have a really smart um, problem solving take on it. I think that, yeah, their job as social commentary is really just to make us think about these issues and then we are supposed to figure it out. So I completely support um, anywhere that it's showing up more in entertainment. Um, but I mean, I haven't seen a TV show or a movie misrepresented to a degree that I would hesitate to say what I just did. Um, but I guess that would be possible. But everything that I've seen, uh, I'm just excited for it to be more in um, the spotlight. Yeah. So, is it my imagination, or do you agree that these issues are more popular uh, today than in the past few years? It's not your imagination at all. Um, it definitely is, I think, for, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what reasons, The just the use of the phrase mass incarceration has really skyrocketed in the past 10 years. Um, I would say that it really has gotten to a point to where um, policy analysis is, is just too um, undeniable that the system isn't working. So a lot of the tough on crime policies beginning in the 70s but really going into the 80s and 90s, we were getting to a point not only where it just costs too much money to keep so mi millions of people in cages, but um, that would incentivize looking at the data but also just the data was ripe for policy analysts to look at and say um, these tough on crime policies didn't work, um, they're not working, and that on top of the cost of the system that isn't working really um, allowed for the political will to address it. Um, and then, just on top of that, I think that um, 
part of it just comes with it being the information age. So like you kind of can't get away with maintaining such an ingest system when, as far as like police reform goes, when everyone pulls out their iPhone and videos you when something bad goes on. Um, if a cop brutalizes someone or something like that. Um, I think that there's lots of different reasons why it's kind of hyped up in the past few years, but um, mostly just it, it's gotten to the point to where if you look at the numbers, you can't deny that the policies didn't work and they're not working. And in some cases, they're counterproductive. Counterproductive how? Um, so we know that incarceration rates kind of move independently of crime rates. Um, when you up the incarceration rate, that doesn't make the crime rate drop. Um, some people would argue that that did happen earlier on in the system. Um, David Brooks had an, um, had a column in the New York Times today that kind of said that, and everyone wonders where he got that from. But there really is no evidence that incarceration rates um, have a meaningful correlation with crime rates, but there is great evidence that in the juvenile justice system, actually injecting a kid into that system can increase the likelihood of criminal behavior. Um, I mean, not to oversimplify it, but people talk about if you go to federal prison, you get your PhD in crime. Um, you come out and then you're the crime boss for your neighborhood whenever you do get out. But um, it, evidence suggests in the juvenile system, I'm confident in saying that the criminal justice system can actually increase the crime rates in um, those individuals. So finally, what are some ways that people like me, um, the average American, no matter what occupation, how can we get more involved in um, reforming the criminal justice system? Um, my, I would, um, I would really, I think that people should be encouraged to engage in local politics. Um, so right now, the local prosecutors are kind of blindly reelected in almost every jurisdiction. Um, but hold your prosecutors accountable if you think that um, a certain issue is being targeted too much in your community, like a nonviolent crime that no one cares about. And the prosecutors sending people um, is asking for the maximum every time. I would say organize with other members of your community and either vote against that prosecutor the next time or tell him that you will if you um, if you don't think that he starts to engage in more reasonable charging of certain crimes. Um, I also think that civilian oversight of police is a big deal that people should engage in. I know that some states don't allow for um, civilians to actually sanction a member of the police force, but lots of states do. So you would encourage a local, you would campaign for a local ordinance that 20 civilians serve on this board and whenever a cop does something messed up, like this community decides what happens, not his 
supervisor or not some prosecutor behind some behind closed doors where he gets 30 day suspension with pay um, I think there's lots of ways that really from the local level can you can do way more powerful and revolutionary reforms at the local level than you can at the state and then you definitely can at the national level and honestly it's not a lot of our incarcerated people in the U.S. are in federal prison. Most of them are in state prison. And then if you'll go into those states, you can find a handful of counties or municipalities that are shoving all the people into the system. Um, it really, I think that there's most room for revolutionary reform at the local level. And that's kind of where you look to, to figure out what policies are working. I mean, before any state banned the box for um, employment applications, where you have to mark if you have a felony, um, before any state even considered passing a statewide law, that it, they wouldn't require that for public employment, cities were doing it. And it was revolutionary. So. Um, I think that anyone who's interested in this, that isn't a journalist, isn't a lawyer, isn't a public policy analyst, uh, finds something that just doesn't seem right with how the criminal justice system is functioning in your community and affect change at the local level. Well, thank you for telling us about this. And viewers, um, again, my name is Katrina Hafner. I'm a blogger and playwright. I study at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington, and am double majoring in anthropology and theater. You can check out my work at katrinahafner.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Liberty Me. And Blake, do you have anything you want to add? Um, just thanks for having me. Um, if you do find this interesting, uh, I'm trying to be more active on my Twitter. It's, um, at bfeldman89. And um, if you're interested in body cams and body cam legislation, which I think that most... Um, a lot of people who identify as libertarian are because of the really fine line with policy of keeping the um, government accountable and transparent while also not wanting some mass surveillance system. I had an op-ed published this afternoon in the Clarion Ledger that I think that you would enjoy. But um. Thanks for having me, and I'm really looking forward to the conference. Thank you, Blake. And for those of you who want to watch more shows on Liberty Me, there is Unbiased America, which is airing tomorrow, September 30th, Wednesday, at 8 p.m. EDT. And then The Future of Freedom on Thursday, October 1st, at 8 p.m. CDT. Um, Scott Horton will be interviewing Jacob Hornberger of the Future of Freedom Foundation. And remember that the SFL Portland Regional Conference will be on Saturday, November 14th. Thank you for tuning in. So what made you want to reach out to me to speak at this conference? Um. Well, right now, it's a very common topic, criminal justice reform, but once you get into it, you start to notice really common themes in how it's covered in um, general media or um, kind of generalized political rhetoric. So you often, if you read an article on criminal justice reform today, it will probably start out um, mentioning that it's bipartisan, talking about an unlikely alliance between 
the Koch brothers and the ACLU. Um, then you'll hear that. Um, so pretty much everything from police civilian encounters to um, sentencing, a lot of it's left out. So um, I think that a lot of topics have fallen by the way aside. Um, we need to reevaluate the need for um, pre-trial detention, so bail reform, um, things like that, municipal court schemes that are really unfair, um, and money-making meals. Debtors' prison is a problem, and something that I care more about um, within the entire system. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, my name is Katrina Hafner, and I am the conference director for the Students for Liberty Portland Regional Conference. And here, who I have with me is Blake Feldman, who is going to be one of the speakers. Blake, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm um, sure. I'm Blake Feldman. I recently graduated from law school at the University of Georgia, and now I am the advocacy coordinator for criminal justice reform um, for the ACLU of Mississippi. The U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of it's incarcerated. And then you'll usually hear something about sentencing reform or ending the war on drugs. But even if we were to decriminalize drugs and have more reasonable sentencing that wouldn't come close to solving a lot of our problems with the criminal justice system. So I just think that it's important to analyze potential reforms now really critically to make sure that we're not just um, implementing stopgap measures that have failed in the past. What do you plan to speak about specifically at the conference? Some is the need for indigent defense reform because all across the country people are denied access to a uh, public defender. Um, but then on the back end, and what's really interesting to me is all the hurdles that face people with criminal records in our country, um, which is of more concern now just because of the internet and because of keeping records. Um, the government does it more than they ever have before. Um, and that can, that can cause problems with immigration, with housing, with employment, um, with so many different things. So a lot of these collateral consequences of arrest can um, 